Hi, Sam. Good morning. Uh, or not, I yes. don't know. Is it morning? It's morning for me. It's uh, 6.30 a.m. where I'm at. Whoa, it is. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for getting up so early. Do you normally get up this early? Are you a morning person? I, I do normally get up this early. Yeah. You know, uh, I found that as my kids get older, the yeah. time that I get by myself tends to be in the dark early before they wake up for school. So, uh, you know, if, if anybody is following me on <clears throat> on Clubhouse, you know that I like to do early Clubhouse rooms. In fact, this time yesterday, I was already 35 minutes into a room. So er early is good for me, which is why I chose this time. Well done you. Do you have your coffee next to you? Or do you not I've got a little, I've, I've got a spot of tea next to me. Mm. Oh, you're being very British. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Sam, we're going to talk to you today about a super interesting topic. And I'm sure every single person listening to this will be so excited to hear from you. We're going to talk about ghosting, being ghosted by clients. But before we jump into that, I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you live, how how did you get to where you are today? Like, what did you do before? What do you do now? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I appreciate that. For those of you who do not know me, uh, my name is Sam Jacobson. I am a sales and pricing and copywriting expert for wedding pros. I have been in hospitality for 27 years now, restaurants, hotels, and events. I've been working uh, exclusively in events since 2006. So for the last 15 years, I have been absolutely obsessed about how to make more money for the businesses that I've worked for. And I, I got started in, in events uh, by accident. Uh, the event manager at the resort that I was at had to leave on short notice to take care of uh, a, a sick family member. And so the GM pulled me out of the restaurants where I was managing and said, hey, guess what? You're the new event guy. So I asked, when do I start? He said, in two hours, we have a ceremony rehearsal that we need you to lead. So I you know, kind of got thrown in to the wolves, baptism by fire, whatever metaphor you want to use. And, and I loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. And, and so a couple years in, I, I realized that I was flatlining on the sales. Mm -hmm. And I thought that at the time, my, my charisma, my natural abilities, my connections, uh, you know, a little bit of luck was going to get me where I needed to go. And I, and I realized in looking at the numbers that I was not able to do the kind of great work that I wanted to do or that my company needed me to do. And so I decided I had to actually get good at doing sales work. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to the bookstore and I bought everything I could about buyer psychology, decision-making theory, behavioral economics, cognitive sciences, anything that related to learning how humans make decisions. And I read and I read and I read and I learned. And then I applied it to all of the inquiries, the hundreds of inquiries we were getting. And I found what worked. And I, I tested certain approaches out and I got results. And the ones that didn't work out very well, I didn't do any more. And the ones that did, I did more of. And over an eight year period, I was able to really fine tune what was uh, an incredible sales process, buying experience for the couples that I was working with. So uh, I had quadrupled the sales at the resort for the events uh, over mm -hmm. over that, that five, six year period. And this was during the Great Recession when the economy was not doing so well. And I thought, well, if I can do this here, maybe I can do this other places. So I got picked up as the number two at Todd Events in Texas. Uh, and I was able to work in, in a luxury space and for a big planning design decor floral company. And, and I was the director of operations, so I wasn't doing day-to-day -day selling, but I, I got a good feeling of what it was that uh, couples in the luxury segment were interested in. And I realized, you know, it's not much different than what I had learned before. And so I thought, well, if I can, if I can make companies like resorts and planning design decor floral companies successful, I'm guessing I can probably do that for other companies as well. So I left the position I was in and started a consulting company, ID Action Consulting. And that was in December of 2016. And so I co-own that with my wife, uh, Katie Taylor Jacobson, who has actually more sales experience than I do in the wedding industry. She sold for 22 years directly to couples, 14 of those for the Four Seasons brand. 
And uh, together we do sales coaching one-to-one. I do that. We do online course instruction and uh, we also do in-person workshops. And then over the last couple of years, we've expanded into copywriting for websites Mm -hmm. and for blog content and also for sales proposals. And so I head up the, the sales coaching portion of the company and she does the conversion copywriting for our clients. Wonderful. Thank you for that CV. That sounds like you have a huge like wealth of experience and knowledge and I cannot wait to hear more. Um, I love what it says on your website <laughs> when you first get on the website. Sometimes being your own boss feels like a season of Hunger Games. <laughs> no tools, no map, no guide. I'm like, yeah, that's what it feels like, especially if you're just starting out in an industry. And you're like, where do the clients come from? What do I do? That is so, so true. Yeah, and in it terms- is. It's tough. <laughs> it's tough because I think, you know, when when we get into, you know, whatever creative field you are in, photography or events, um, you know, design, decor, whatever it may be, there's there's a drive that gets you into business that is about the creative expression or serving others uh and and the business part of it goes along with it but we you know we typically don't deal with that reality until we run into problems and and so that's that's one of the things that happens so so often when trying to make enough money to support the business and and not stress out about it and it's a skill set that almost nobody goes to school for and almost nobody has gone through any formal training before they open their business or start doing what they do in their creative field. Yeah. You really have to dig for that information yourself um, and learn it yourself. And for me, I've always approached like client uh, inquiries very much like dating. I always thought, well, if they don't reply, they're just not that into you. They don't want you. (laughs) But what you're saying, what you said so far, it does sound like, there are actual things you can do to not get ghosted by clients and to get to, to even make them change their mind and like make them uh, actually buy. So first of all, I would love to, th- to know, um, since like you know so much about the psychology behind it as well, like why is it that sometimes when clients inquire, um, and they sound so excited, they sound like they're really in, they really want this, they end up ghosting and not booking and we never hear back from them. Why is that? It's because they're not yet ready to commit. Um, there's a few different types of yeses uh, or um, you know mm-hmm. commitments that you can get from people. Mm-hmm. There's the kind that they say mm-hmm. because they think that they're interested and then they later reverse course. Mm-hmm. There's the kind of commitment or yes that they give you where um, they say yes, just to be nice on the phone or on the email because they don't want to be mean, Mm -hmm. right? This is the like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'll call you back later. I had such a great time. Can't wait to do this again. And then you're like, okay, I got out of there. I don't have to face them anymore. So that's, that's that kind of uh, getting ghosted. Uh, But, but I, I think, I think really what it comes down to is that to use your dating metaphor, a lot of professionals who are pitching their services to potential clients are trying to get married on the first date. And, <laughs> and, and so while we, while we, we say that, that we got ghosted, um, it's typically that we scared them away. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. I, I kind of, I liken it to, to this. And again, I love the dating metaphor. I use it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you went on a first date and somebody was like, hi, my name is Sam. Uh, I've been divorced once. I have a 12 year old kid. Here are my politics. Here are my religions. This is this is what I would like to do for my future. Yeah. Um, th- these are all of the things that that you should know about me. And then, what's your name? Or tell me more about you. <laughs> if if you if you did all of this before mm-hmm. you got to know the person, mm-hmm. uh, got into you know really deep topics or complex topics. Uh, then you're going to scare the crap out of people, right? Mm-hmm. And and I think if you go through and you look at the people who are typically getting ghosted, they're getting ghosted because they're sharing too much information too early. Oh. And so if you if you are somebody who responds to an inquiry with, 
a massive email or a ton of information, um, mm -hmm. may, maybe a big, big pricing guide that's attached. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, we'll definitely talk about pricing, mm -hmm. I'm sure, over the course of the conversation. But if you just share too much information all at one time, imagine opening up on the other end of that email on your phone, mm -hmm. which has a screen that's very small. All of that information, that big, huge, long email with those big walls of text and, and then this big PDF attachment that comes through with all of this other information that you've got to go through and look at. And, and all you're thinking is like, I just wanted to know if this person was available and kind of what the ballpark pricing was. Mm -hmm. And then they give me all of this information instead. And so what we do is we, we, you know, we, we turn into a stage five clinger rather than somebody who might be interesting to go out on a second date with. That sounds great. However, if you get like, you know, the first inquiry by a client, then what is the right way to reply to that? If in that first email, you know, the client is like, well, I want to know your rates, you know, are you available? And what is your rate for the day or whatever, it, whatever the product or service is? What uh, in, in your experience and opinion, what is the right way to reply to that first contact? So what we want to do is we want to provide the right information at the right time and, and in the right way. And so mm -hmm. when we're talking about price, there's really two different types of price conversations that we want to have with our, our potential clients. We want to have one that's a general price conversation early on. This could be a starting at price on your website. This could be something that you mention um, in an email response. Um, uh, th this would be something in maybe even a discovery call towards the end that you would talk about general prices. Here's here, you know, they, they start at this or here's a low and a high range. Um, mm -hmm. Later on, we want to dive deeper into the specific pricing for the products and services that we offer. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to get too specific about the products or services that we offer and the pricing that goes along with them until we know that the buyer is ready for that information. Mm -hmm. And and one of the the key key strategies here is to make sure that uh, again we're providing that right info at the right time and in the right way and and we want to match up the information that we're sharing with the different stage of awareness that the buyer is in. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to, you know, kind of marketing 101, uh, a guy named Eugene Schwartz back in the 60s put out this approach that has has been pretty, you know, pretty solid over the last 50 years, which is these five stages of awareness. And you have unaware, problem aware, solution aware, product aware, and then most aware, ready to buy. And, and what we need to do is we need to go through and recognize what kind of information to share based on what stage of awareness the potential client is at. So if you share very specific information about your products and services and your pricing to somebody who doesn't even know what they really need yet, it's not going to resonate or connect or, or match what it is that they see as a good value mm -hmm. or as something that is worth spending their money on. Mm -hmm. So if I told you the specifics about, I don't know, say hotel rooms and prices when you were planning a trip to I don't know, say to, to the United States and, and you were planning on going to say New York. And I was like, oh yeah, here's 14 different hotel rooms that you can pick. And here, here's the layout and the square footage and the amenities and the pricing for each one of them. You would go, well, hold on a second. I haven't even picked my dates yet. I don't even know what part of the city I want to go to. I don't know how many days I want to stay. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody inquires for say photography services and you send over, here's how many hours of coverage Here's how many photographers will will be photographing the the, the event. Here's the album's uh, number of pages and the size of the album, and, and so on. And that person is like, I just wanted to know if you were available and like what kind of things you do for me. But you gave me all of this specific information that I'm not ready for yet. Mm -hmm. So the reason, in short, why we get ghosted is because we provide the right info at the wrong time, mm -hmm. too early.
Mm-hmm. Okay. That's like talking about politics and religion on the first date. You just don't do it and get to a second date. <laughs> well, it depends. Some people do. <laughs> <laughs> so you're right. You're right. So you're right. Some people do, and yeah. and and those people have success, and they do it that way. I think that if you know if if you wanted if you wanted a better opportunity to get to a second date, probably don't talk about who you vote for or who you pray to <laughs> too early in in the relationship. Okay, so this is also, guys listening, this is also a dating uh, advice podcast now. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, like, it is a bit like it. It is a bit like uh, selling yourself. But back to selling. Um, so basically what you're saying is after that first co- client contact, it is better and more important to ask questions first and to listen like, and find out where is this client? What what do they want? What do they need? Spot on. That's exactly right. Mm-hmm. You you know, it's a general rule. I recommend not to send specific pricing and product information to anybody who doesn't know what they need and, and doesn't know what you do to help meet those needs. You know, we, we, we exist as a business to provide a solution to the problems and needs that our, our customers have. Mm-hmm. And and everything starts with learning what those needs are. And those needs could be pain points. They could be pleasure points. You know, we're either providing a, a painkiller or a vitamin. Mm-hmm. You know, we either want to to make something less bad or we want to give them more good. And And our job early on in the sales process is to discover what it is that that they want to need. What is what is giving them heartburn what is keeping them up at night what what are they arguing about if there if there are multiple people making the decision what's what's the conflict that we are there to help resolve mm-hmm. and what are the things that they hope to experience what are the joys and the pleasures that they want to receive by receiving your product or service only when we know those things can we truly offer a solution that is going to be valuable to them and and part of this process is not just us learning what that is so that we can create a, a, a package or collection of services that is going to meet those needs, but it's helping them understand what it is that they need. Mm-hmm. Most people have no clue what they want when they approach you for a big ticket purchase. Let's just say photography. So if you're a photographer and you know, say they're getting married and they come to you with, hey, what are your packages and your pricing? that you could give that to them, but it means nothing and because there's no context. They don't, they don't know why you need, let's say an engagement session. There's a false belief by couples that an engagement session is done primarily to get photographs of you that they can have in addition to the photographs of the wedding. Yeah. But every good wedding photographer knows that an engagement session is really an opportunity for you to build rapport and trust with your Uh, with your couple. It's a great opportunity for them to learn to feel comfortable in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. It's a good opportunity for you to find prompts that that work and don't work so Mm -hmm. that you can make adjustments on uh, the big day. And so if, if you, if you just sent, you know, an $800 or say $600 engagement session price to somebody who thought that they were just getting photos they wouldn't understand the true value of why you're charging $800 or $600 because if they're making a $3,000 or $4,000 investment later for the wedding, this $600 or $800 mini investment is going to be something that prepares them to achieve even bigger success by looking great and feeling comfortable and, Mm -hmm. and, and not feeling rushed on the wedding day. And so now there's more value in what it is that you're, you're offering them and they're more likely to pay for it, not only because they know, what they're really getting by doing an engagement session, but they understand how much more of an impact it's going to have on the overall success to reach their goals or take away their, their pain point. Mm-hmm. Would you say there's, I mean, there's always exceptions to everything, but would you say there's like exceptions and nuances to this conversation as well? Because um, sometimes, for example, with a lot of people listening to this will be photographers, of course, um, and they have set packages that even if a client comes back to them explaining like they, all their different needs, this photographer might not change their package. You know, this is it. Uh, these are my two or three or however many packages. And this is what, what you can choose from. I won't like customize it necessarily. There are people who do custom packages, of course. 
and then um like for example some some photographers and i used to do that as well when i did weddings they have the pricing sheet pdf or the link on their website with the pricing and it's not just the pricing it's not just the package you know engagement session six hundred dollars it's also like an explanation what that is why it's useful you know just everything that you just said um explained alongside with it like package one you know and then like an explanation not just the hours and the numbers and what you get but why and and like the education behind it um what do you think about that is that also too much information like to expect someone to read all of that um would you how do you feel about that is that a good tactic to use or not so I do like I do like sharing a lot of information with people, but I would do it not all at one time. It's like mm -hmm. an avalanche when it all comes mm -hmm. in at once. Okay. Um, and, and, right. Instead, we want to layer it in, and and we want to we want to make sure that we're you know kind of dropping it in there as they as they're ready for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think that when it comes to the sharing the information, you want to first develop the need for somebody to want the information from you. Um, as a as a problem solver, which is what I love doing. I mean, I do jigsaw puzzles on the weekends for fun still. As a 43-year-old, this is my idea of relaxing. Uh, and and so I, I love a good problem to solve. But what I've learned over decades of doing this is that if you offer solutions to problems that people don't yet know they have, mm -hmm. they either won't accept it or they could even get upset mm -hmm. that you have told them that they don't know something or that they are doing something wrong or that they, they, they have an issue that they're not yet aware of. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes when we go through with the services that we offer for, in this case, photography, um, we need to make sure that they're ready to hear that they're awkward in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that they're ready to hear <clears throat> that they, they actually do want to look back on their wedding images in a, like an, a tangible photo album rather than just putting them on a thumb drive and letting them dust away in a drawer of an office that they don't go to. So there, there's, there's, there's that component of it. So yes, I do like the idea of sharing a, a, a link to an unpublished page as, um, as a proposal. Um, I, I do think that uh, there's, there's high value in that, uh, especially explaining and connecting the the features of your services with the benefits that the client receives so that's mm -hmm. that's super important mm -hmm. and that was kind of this that was a, an answer to the second part of your question to go back to the first part um this idea of customizing or tailoring we call it tailoring proposals and i'm going to switch metaphors out of dating and i'm going to i'm going to move it over into um fashion um, which i don't know very much about but i know a little bit and enough to know that <clears throat> if you want somebody to spend top dollar for the clothes that you are selling as a retailer as a fashion designer if you told people that you had three sizes and they had to figure out which one was going to fit them best yeah. and there was no opportunity to hem or tailor or, or size it to their body, mm -hmm. you are gonna get people who are gonna pass on your services, especially if it is a high dollar amount, and they're gonna find somebody who's gonna tailor the clothes to them. And so if you, if you don't offer uh, that tailoring service, if you just offer off the rack, and, and you're not able to modify what it is that people are getting from you to their very specific needs, mm -hmm. they're less likely to one, buy from you and two, pay more for the services than somebody else who's offering the same generic package for a lower price. And this is, this is really the thing that, that we, we want during the, the sales process, or as, as I like to call it, the buying experience, we want to make sure that, that our clients or potential clients are, are feeling like we're hearing what it is that they want from us. Mm -hmm. And so when people feel heard and then understood and accepted for their hopes and dreams and their fears, when we hear them, understand them and accept them, they then feel important. And this is ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to make people feel accepted, which is a basic human desire going back to thousands of generations. And, and we are translating that into making them feel therefore important. Mm -hmm. And when they feel important and, and, and accepted, they're going to spend money with us because mm -hmm. we made them feel that way. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Yeah, it's that it's that empathy and really listening to someone and making them feel seen and heard and known. Like that you know what they want, you hear what they're saying, and you have something that can help them, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. Um so let's let's say okay, someone is, is ready. They are ready now for the pricing information. <laughs> they are at the stage, um, they're ready to hear it. They're ready to hear it all. What are some, even in, if we talk about pricing itself, um, what are some tactics that business owners can use um, to to make that to make that sale to to actually communicate those numbers that can be sometimes scary if it's like a really um, high if it, if we're talking about high numbers, how can we communicate those um, in a right way? Would you say just because the client is prepared now and they're ready, it will be an easy sale. It's easier. It's easier for sure. You know, to, to, uh, to look at the, the overall buyer's journey, there are really three main points when, well, four, if you count the website and I'm not inquiring, uh, mm -hmm. three main points in, in the buyer's journey for the sales part of the process where people get ghosted. Number one is on the initial inquiry response, which we've talked about. Yeah. Number two is when you actually present your proposal for services. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is like you talked about in the very beginning when somebody says, oh, this is so great. I'm going to take this back to my fiance and we're going to get you a deposit tomorrow. And then mm -hmm. nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So those are really the three main areas. So mm -hmm. the, I think this question that you just asked is kind of the second area where people get ghosted quite a bit yeah. and 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 so here's the this is the best thing if like if you are listening to this right now stop whatever else you're doing if you're multitasking write this thing down because this is like the big takeaway okay. from the podcast episode you've got your pen thank you my pen. so uh, so so this is it you need to ensure that you have another opportunity to talk with the person about the proposal for services that you are putting out so Before you get off of the first phone call, you want to set up a second phone call. So you're going to, you're going to talk with them on the discovery call. You have not shared your services or pricing yet. You're going to do that in a, in a proposal okay. could be, could be a, a document you send over or a link to an unpublished webpage, whatever it may be, but you're going to send over that proposal. But before you send over the proposal, You want to do everything you can to schedule, to pre-schedule a second phone call to talk okay. with them about the proposal that you're going to send over. So just to put this in, in context, let's say it's uh, it's Wednesday and uh, you and I are talking about my amazing photography services and you're super excited. And I say, uh, Nadia, this, this sounds so great. I, you know, you and Nick are going to have such an amazing wedding. I, I hope that I'm the photographer to, uh, to capture the moments. Um, I'd love to put together some options for you to consider. Is that something you're interested in? You say, yes, Sam, that sounds great. I say, wonderful. Uh, when are you and Nick looking at uh, going over this proposal? And you would say, oh, we're super busy this week, but we're going to take some time over the weekend to look at it. I say, fabulous. Why don't I get you a proposal by, say, the end of the day tomorrow, mm -hmm. Thursday, mm -hmm. so you and Nick can look it over over the weekend Clearly, there's going to be a lot of information there, and I want to make sure that I can clarify any questions that you have so that you can make a decision and know that you have all of the right information before making that decision. A lot of my clients have found that a quick 10 to 15 minute phone call after they've had a chance to review the proposal is super helpful. What time on Monday or Tuesday works for you and Nick to jump on a call with me? Okay, go something just like that. It's very simple, very easy. This will work probably. Well, when you get started, maybe six or seven times out of 10, by the, like, by the time you get good at it, maybe eight or nine times out of 10, you will get a person on a second phone call. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason why you want to do this is because when somebody makes a commitment to do something, they're, they're going to feel obligated to follow through on their commitment that they made to you. And so if you want to not get ghosted, you need to set up the next activity mm -hmm. for you two to connect. And that's what this does. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a next activity, it's way too easy for them to, to go, oh, you know what? I'll look at that tomorrow. And then tomorrow mm -hmm. comes and it's like, oh, I'll look at it this weekend. Mm -hmm. And then this weekend comes and it's like, oh, you know what? I'm so busy. I'm just going to get back to them next week. And then that's how you end up getting ghosted. Mm -hmm. So schedule that second phone call. 
This is a game changer. It's easily one of the top three skills that you need to uh, uh, become great at booking more business and doing it at higher rates. This is so good. I wrote it down, by the way. <laughs> um, this is really amazing, actually, to also, at, as the business owner, to be committed to those leads um, and not just send out something and then just wait until you hear back or until you don't. Um, but actually also showing commitment from your side uh, as well. Uh, if we, you know, same as dating, if we use that metaphor again, and not just, not just wait around, but show that, you know, you're, you're there too, you're committed to this as well, uh, and you want to follow up. That's really, really great. So we have asking questions and listening and giving the information a bit by bit, not all at once. We have scheduling the sec an another phone call opportunity to talk in some kind of way um, after they actually have the price. What other tips um, or, or strategies do you have for people to avoid getting go ghosted, like in terms of, you know, website and language you use, copywriting, or other things that maybe we haven't mentioned yet? What are the things that you're like, you need to know this? Sure, sure. And I'd love to talk about uh, websites and copywriting, uh, but I, I also know we want to be, uh, you know, respectful and not talk for the next 17 hours because that's how long I would love to talk about websites and copywriting with you, <laughs> especially with flow themes. Um, but 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 let's let's talk about let's talk about this third area that, mm -hmm. that people tend to get ghosted in, because I think that there, there's one solid tactic that I that I want to share with everybody. Right. And that is. Uh, if we, if we go forward, let's say we get on that second phone call and they're like, "Wow, this the proposal was amazing. We're we're super excited about it. We can't wait to move forward with it. Um, I just need to to you know go through and read the the agreement that you're going to send over and and move some money around and make sure that our our, our accounts are set and squared to make the deposit. Um, we'll get back to you, um, you know, it, it, like by tomorrow." Or, or, or we'll, we'll get we'll, we'll get back to you sooner. Whatever it is that they say, right? You yeah. you cannot let that happen. Like you, like don't allow that to happen. That's <laughs> okay. how you get ghosted again, right? <laughs> like you were talking about when somebody's so excited. I mean, if you have if you have worked with this tip this typical situation where you talk with the, the potential bride and she's super excited, you have a very strong connection. And she says, everything, this, this looks so amazing. I'm just going to talk with my sweetie. You know, we're going to go through the information, send over the contract. We'll get back to you with any questions, but I can't wait to lock in the date. I'm so excited. Yeah. And then nothing, crickets, right? Yeah. Total ghosting. Okay, so so here's this. You're like, yes, this is how it goes. So, so this is... <laughs> this is what we want to do to get through that. We want to create a self-imposed time frame, a deadline for the potential client to commit to. Again, it's all about getting them to commit to a deadline mm -hmm. and, and that next activity. So um, let's say it's at the end of the phone call and, uh, she, you know, again, not, I'm just using Nadia and Nick. So Nadia, it's, you know, you say to me like, wow, this is so amazing. How do you know if you have a, a, a partner or if his, his name is Nick? I'm, I'm just making it up. I could use it as a prophecy, you know, it's like, <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Let's see if we can manifest Nick, your dream boat to come in from the sea. So, <laughs> so, so Nadia and Nick, uh, you know, you, you, you guys are, are you Nadia, you're talking with me on the phone. And, and again, I, as the, the, the service provider, I say, this, this sounds great. I'd love to send over, uh, uh an agreement for you to review. We just need to, you know, take a 20% deposit to secure the date. Um, you know, you say, wow, this is so great. I'm just going to take it back to Nick. We're going to look it over and we'll get back to you. If we have any questions, I say, that looks amazing. Now here's the, here's the, the tactics you go through and you ask them, how long do you think it'll take you to go through the contract and to move the money around in the accounts? Mm -hmm. You, and, 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 and like most people, we, we succumb to what's called the, the planning fallacy. Uh, which is a, a heuristic or a cognitive bias that that we all have where we think that we can do things in a shorter period of time than we actually can. Yeah. And so we want to play into this. So most humans will underestimate how long it takes to do something mm -hmm. and and how they'll 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 underestimate how complicated something is. So they'll think it's going to be done very quickly and very very simple. Mm -hmm. So they'll say something like, "Oh, we just need a couple of days at the most." Yeah. Okay? So or or whatever it is. Oh, we need 3 days or we need 4 days or 2 days or 1 day, whatever it is. 
you get them to commit to something and then you say, wonderful, why don't I do this? Why don't I go ahead and put a soft hold, courtesy hold on the date until that date and time? And if you have any questions before then, just hit me up. I'm happy to answer them. Email, phone, text, carrier, pigeon, whatever you want to do. And, and then I will look for the contract and the deposit to come in. Mm-hmm. And they'll say, oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is like 99 times out of 100. This is how the conversation goes. Yeah. Now, you, you're, you're working with, with other psychological biases that we have. As, as humans, when we have been given something, we don't want to give it back. And when we've been given something, we value it way more than when we didn't have it before we got it. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't want to experience the loss of giving something back. It's called loss aversion. Mm-hmm. And we endow more value into something when we have it. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're giving them a date that they now have and they have to give it back to us, which they don't want to do because they'll experience disutility. And, and we're also giving them something that they now value mm-hmm. very much because they possess it. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're using loss aversion and, and its little sister, the endowment effect, to get people to want to move forward. We, we've set up a situation where instead of them coming to us and saying, I want the date, now what they're having to do is saying, I'm willing to give back the date. And that's a very different decision for somebody to make. Oh, okay. So we, so we're getting we're getting this deadline that they're committing to. And again, humans want to commit to something and and do what they say they're going to do. Mm-hmm. But we're also making it so that they have to undo the status quo, which is that they're getting married on that date and sending you a deposit by this date and time. And and by doing this little shift at the end of the conversation, you're going to find much more success with people following through on actually getting you the contract and the deposit. And of course, it's not gonna work every time and, and, and that's okay. And, and you, there are other things that you can do after it. But if you, if you do this one thing, you're gonna significantly decrease mm-hmm. the amount of ghosting that you see at the end mm-hmm. of the decision-making process. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting point. Um, thank you. Instead of spending 17 hours to talk about websites and copywriting, <laughs> Can you do it in two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I can. So the, the, I can. You know, yeah. What the, the worst mistakes you see people make, or or you know what to what to do um, to to get people sure. interested. So um, uh, probably the biggest area where people get ghosted is on your contact page, mm-hmm. and, um, and and if you don't believe me, go through and look at how many people hit your contact page and how many inquiries you got last Mm -hmm. month. Like no joke, go through and look at the analytics. You'll probably see, I don't know, let's say you have 50 people hit your contact page and you might've seen like four inquiries. So Mm -hmm. that means that 46 people were scared or spooked or ghosted you because of what they felt or didn't feel when they were on the page. Right? So instead of going after more people to get to your website, Focus on what you can do when they're already there. Mm -hmm. And Flow Themes does a great job of creating beautiful design and a great user experience. Mm -hmm. But still, when they get to the contact page, there are so many things that you can do Mm -hmm. to really, you know, mess it up at that at that moment. So um, I'll focus on that. So um, Mm -hmm. first of all, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 80 percent of the people who start to fill out a form will not fill it out. Okay, so that means that that 60 to 80 percent of people are ghosting you. They put their name in, but they don't click submit. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. So what can you do to keep them? There's a few things. Uh, Number one, we want to have a headline and a little bit of copy above the form Mm -hmm. that tells them what they're going to get when they fill the form out. And it should be something that's exciting, you, you know, fill this form out and we're going to start the conversation so you can, you know, get an amazing photography experience or so you can have beautiful floral design or, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to be able to get you pricing and, and service information. You know, if you can take 30 seconds to submit this form, okay. Mm-hmm. Something that says what they're going to get and talks about how easy it is. Mm-hmm. Then we want to make sure that the form is, is not, 
onerous. It's not long. It's not difficult. It doesn't ask questions that they don't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to stay away from things like money, or budget. This is not when you want to qualify clients. Oh. So, so we, so we recommend keeping the form as short as you need to based on the number of inquiries that you're getting. So if you want more inquiries, keep the, keep the contact form short. If you want better qualified inquiries and you're willing to deal with fewer inquiries, then you want to add some fields in to make it longer. But a, a good contact form is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of five to eight fields long. And, and they're going to ask simple questions like name, email, date, venue. Uh, uh, it could be, um, you know, an, op uh, an open field that like, you know, tell me more about what you have in mind for the wedding. Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, anything else you'd like to share about your, your event, something like that. Um, we we want to stay away from questions that are like, you know, what about my work drew you in? Um, or what specific gallery attracts you the most? Or okay. um, uh, what, uh, how much, how much money do you have set aside for photography services? Yeah. Uh, or, um, you know, anything that's too, that's, 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 really challenging for somebody who's just at the beginning of their decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Again, these people don't even know what they need yet. They don't know how much things cost. They've never gotten married. And so if you ask them questions that they don't know the answer to, they're either going to make stuff up or they're going to abandon the form because they just got asked a question they don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. And so, so we, we want to make sure that we're keeping the form short. And then the other thing, this is very, very important. We want to make sure that we provide some social proof. So we want to put testimonials, reviews, as seen in, published in, whatever it is. We want to make sure that we put that on the contact form because we know that this is a risk for them to actually click submit and go on to the next step to, to say, yes, I will go out on a date with you. That, that's a risk. And so we want to provide reassurance and, 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 and social proof that other people who have taken that risk as well had a great experience doing so. So anytime you're going to, you're going to, uh, put out on a, on a website, a call to action, you want to make sure that you're putting some reassurance there right below that call to action. So that's one thing that you can do. You can also put a picture of yourself, um, lo either looking at the contact form or looking at the, you know, at the, the screen, at the, at the camera. So you're making a connection with eye contact yeah. uh, with the person. And that provides a little bit more trust and reassurance and puts a face to the name of the brand and what they're going to get when they, they go through and fill that form out. So pro provide a little bit of copy up above to capture their attention, tell them mm -hmm. what they're going to get and, and make it simple uh, for them to move forward as far as time to fill it out. Keep the contact form as short as you can to get the number of inquiries that you want. And then make sure you're providing some reassurance down below with social proof, testimonials, uh, icons of, of publications that you've been in and, and put a photo in there, either looking over at the form, like you're directing their attention to the form or, or looking directly at the camera so that they can form some sort of connection with you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. These are wonderful. One of my questions on my contact form was, uh, who's your childhood? Who was your childhood superhero? And see something like that, I think is fine. You know, the, because, okay. because that shows, yeah, because that shows your personality, right? Yeah. That shows your personality. I was working with, a. Uh, uh, with a planner o uh, over in, in Italy who does uh, uh, American weddings in Italy. Yeah. And, and, and one of the questions that, that I, I suggested on her contact form, because she was a little bit higher end, one of the questions I suggested was, you know, what's your favorite wine region in, mm -hmm. in Italy? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, or what's your, what's your favorite museum in Italy? Something mm -hmm. like that, that was about Italy, that was fun and also identified you know, have they been to Italy before? Are they yeah. serious about going to Italy or whatever it may be? So yeah. there are lots of different types of questions that you can ask. You just want to make sure that it's something that they can actually answer and yeah. that, that doesn't make them think too hard. The harder you make somebody think, the less they're going to want to continue the relationship. Mm, okay. Easy, easy questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sam. This was so valuable i knew it would be i was really excited about this but um yeah this was really amazing thank you so much for your time so early in the morning i really appreciate it absolutely happy to do it and and if there's everybody who wants any more information uh, we have a ton of free content that's out there 
Um, and you can follow along on Instagram at ID Action Consulting um, or check us out on, on Facebook. We have a, a Facebook group there with lots of uh, deeper dives with some, some uh, additional free uh, tutorials and free content through free workshops that we've done, uh, mm-hmm. you know, especially about contact forms and getting ghosted and inquiry responses. So uh, please, if you've got more interest, uh, check us out, ID Action Consulting. And uh, if you have any other questions, you know, reach out directly to the show notes and, and I'm happy to, to respond as needed. Absolutely. And we will link all of Sam's information as well in the show notes of the podcast. So you can uh, go there and like click on everything and find him everywhere on the internet. So thank you so much, Sam. Thanks. Thank you.